This video is brought to you by the University Writing Center, a unit of the Department of Rhetoric and Writing at the University of Texas at Austin. You can contact us at uwc.utexas.edu. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Dale, and I work in grad services at the University Writing Center. So before I introduce our speaker, uh, I'd like to point out that we do have some exciting programs coming up this summer, um, including a workshop series for grad students early on in their dissertation. Um, as of right now, it looks like the workshops will be held on Wednesdays in June and July, and they're cover, cover topics like reading model introductions, building templates, and setting writing goals. So keep an eye on our website for details on that. I'll put our website in, um, info in the chat. But uh, right now, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Patricia Roberts Miller, who will be leading our workshop today on overcoming writing challenges. She is a pro uh, professor emeritus of rhetoric and writing uh, here at UT Austin. She was also, until recently, the director of the UT Writing Center. Um, along with all this, she's, of course, an extremely accomplished academic. She's the author of numerous articles and books. Um, two of her most recent books are Demo Demagoguery and Democracy and Rhetoric and Demo Demagoguery. So please join me in welcoming Professor Roberts Miller. Thank you. So I'm gonna put in the chat um, the um, one of two ways to get the handout from today. That's one. And then the other is, right here. Um, 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 on my blog, and so you can always get access to it there. Um, so I love doing these kinds of workshops because I, um, I just I, I think that we have a lot of messages about writing that are not necessarily tremendously helpful. But anyone who got into graduate school is a good enough writer to get out regardless of your field. And um, I think when we struggle with, with writing as scholars, it's because we've had certain practices and approaches that have always worked up to this point and they stop working. And we have a tendency to think it's because of something about us. And it's actually just that graduate school writing is really, really different. And, um, and the processes that got us here are not necessarily the processes that are going to be best for finishing. I'm a bit, also a big believer that um, we have a tendency as writers to have relied a lot on panic and um, panic as motivating us, as, um, as what enables us to silence that hypercritical voice that tells us every sentence we're writing is really bad. And people do it, but you really don't wanna to try to keep yourself in a state of panic for the entire time that you're writing your dissertation. Um, it's not sustainable. And in particular, it's not sustainable when you, um, you know, once you get a job, and you're trying to do a book um, or a series of articles or grants or, or whatever. It's just, you, you don't want a life when you're in a constant state of panic. If, if we wanted to do that, then we would have become, you know, high powered attorneys and we'd be making four times what we do. Um, so the, um, so what I want to start with, or what are, uh, so basically the, the short version of this workshop is that, um, right, you know, graduate school writing and scholarly writing is challenging. And I want to try to name some of what those challenges are and talk about ways of getting around them. And there's no way that's going to work all the time. A lot of people find the book, Writing Your Dissertation in 15 Minutes a Day, very helpful. Um, there's also a book that the, that the Writing Center uses a lot because it's great. Um, and it's called Writing Your Scholarly Article in uh, 12 Weeks or Less. Um, and there's also Dissertation, uh, Destination Dissertation, which is a really good book. But the short version is any one of those, the strategies that people talk about, they're gonna work for some things and not for others. And that's okay, just use different strategies. The way I think to think about it that's the most useful is to think about writing a dissertation or a book or you know, a set of articles or, or whatever as um, as a, a getting a place, getting somewhere that we're trying to go. And we normally take a particular route. Sometimes that route's not gonna work. And um, so it's useful to know about other routes. Does that make sense? So in other words, when you hit that moment of you're writing 15 minutes a day, no longer working, don't panic. <laughs> just, just take the bus instead. Okay, 
So one of the big differences that I think um, graduate students really struggle with is that as an undergrad, what people are expecting from you as a writer is in a lot of fields, just a smart insight. And it's well organized, your, your presentation, and you bring in you know, the concepts from class. And so that's a kind of paper that you write in the last minute. You have to write it in the last minute. Lots of professors, I did this all the time, would tell students, now get started early, but they can't. You can't start early because you don't have the concepts yet. It's the same thing in coursework in graduate school. You can't start early <laughs> because you know, you, you're still learning. You're learning the stuff that you're gonna be using. So, um, so typically our writing process through undergrad and, um, and even I think through coursework is the first step is to come up with our argument. That's the first thing we think of is what's my insight? What's my point? Um, and that's not gonna work um, starting with writing a dissertation. That's gonna get, lead, lead you to a lot of writing blocks and <clears throat> a lot of stress. So, um, um, and scholarly argument, what people will always say to you is it contributes to a conversation, it changes the scholarly conversation, what's your intervention in the conversation? And that's not the question that we know instantly, that's often something that it's gonna take us a while to figure out. So you don't wanna start by trying to answer that question. And I think what's really different about writing as a scholar um, and graduate students or just junior scholars is that um, in graduate school, you're extending a very specific scholarly conversation in a very specific way. And that's what it takes us a while to figure out is what's the really specific conversation and what's our specific contribution to it. So some of the things that make scholarly writing hard, <clears throat> um, especially for graduate students and junior scholars is that our understanding of the scholarly conversation is too broad. And um, so, you know, my, well, I actually have three degrees in rhetoric. Um, and so, you know, I, I thought of my dissertation as contributing to rhetoric, to scholarship and rhetoric. And that's not a useful way to think about it. That's like thinking that I'm gonna take a trip to Europe. Well, where, <laughs> you know, I, you can't go to Europe. You, get, you go to someplace in Europe. So um, I was gonna change a conversation about, was it deliberative rhetoric? Um, was it about environmental rhetoric? Was it about um, social, um, you know, social movement rhetoric? Which of those is it? Um, one way I think that can be helpful to, to think about that for yourself is if you're going to um, a conference in your field, what panels do you go to? Because you don't go to every panel, right? So what are the panels you go to? And those, that's the conversation that you're likely to change. If you can find articles in relatively recent journals that you feel like you're adding to in some way, you're extending their argument or um, responding to their argument, that's also a really good way to, to think about. It, it gives you, a, once again, a, a fairly specific conversation that, that you're joining. Um, as I said, we, we're accustomed to starting the writing process by coming up with our thesis. And, um, and I also feel like the, the metaphor, it's not a wrong metaphor when we say that, like, what's your contribution to the field? Um, but you don't, we don't know the field, right? I, I still feel like I don't know the field um, of rhetoric and I'm always surprised by work that people are doing. And so I, as I say, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, if I invite you over to my house and we're standing in the front hall, I say, what changes do you think I should make to my house? And you're like, I don't know, I've only seen the front hall. Um, so that's what it's sort of like, you know, when people ask you as a graduate student or junior scholar to what contributions are you making to the field? I don't know, I can tell you what to redo with the, the front hall, right? So that's, that's the way to think about it, the really specific changes. Um, and uh, I also think, so we talk a lot about <clears throat> what's the gap. And in fact, everybody, including me, every graduate student, graduate course I taught, including the last one, which was just a year ago, um, you, you draw this little thing on the board that's from John Swales, who did lots of really good empirical research. And you say, okay, here's the, you know, the, converse, the big conversation. And then you're gonna describe this little hole. There's a hole missing. There's something we haven't talked about. And that's what your research is gonna be about. And um, that's good, but it's, it's uh, a limited metaphor. It's a limited model because 
um, that really came out of a time when there was there were much more identifiable fields. If you were going to write about, um, you know, uh, the military campaign of Gettysburg of a particular um, of Lee or something, actually, I don't remember if he was the one there. Anyway, you're um, you just read all the research that's on that, and then you can say what's missing from this research. We can't do that anymore, right? Um, when I started graduate school, you know, someone was saying, well, if you're writing about Joseph Conrad, you're gonna read every single thing that's been written about Joseph Conrad. Well, we can't, right? So, um, so that's how we can get into this like one more book thing is that if we, if we try to read everything that there is on the subject, then we'll notice the gap. Um, I think instead it's, um, well, I'll get to the to the and I'll, I'll get to what we should do instead. Um, as I mentioned, I think we let panic drive the bus. Um, it's the strategy that we've learned, and that has been rewarding for us. Um, it's a it's a it's just a way. Um, it got us to to where we you know it got us to grad school, right? Um, and so it can be kind of difficult to say that's not a strategy that's going to work anymore. I will say a lot of advisors still rely on it. I, I know faculty who still rely on panic um, and a lot of self-shaming to, um, to motivate themselves. And so sometimes they feel like they're really helping graduate students and junior scholars by shaming them and working them into a panic. And I would just say, try to take that as coming from a good place and ignore it. <laughs> um, and once you become a faculty member, don't see your job as panicking students or shaming them and yeah. Um, and I, I think actually trying to stay away from self-shaming as much as possible is just a good strategy in general. And um, also, and it took me a long time to figure this out. So um, in graduate school, in graduate seminars, we read the um, biggest names and that's what, that's what should happen. That's what we should be doing. We, we're reading the best research regardless of the field. And so that's typically um, people is, um, who have, you know, they're, they're very advanced in their careers and they're not beginning scholars. Well, one of the things that Ken Highland and John Swale showed, there goes Ruth, um, is that junior scholars write differently from people who were toward the end of their career. Um, people who are very advanced and who are major names can get away with really broad generalizations, um, can make these statements about what the field is like that people just won't let a junior scholar do, um, can, make, can, can do things like neologisms, which a lot of people don't like in junior scholars um, and don't have to cite as much. There's just all sorts of ways that, so what this means is, the templates that we have in our brains from what we're reading in graduate school and in the graduate seminars and is presented to us as models. You know, no one has rung the doorbell all day. <laughs> the second I get on Zoom, somebody does. Okay, anyway. Um, so the, uh, yeah, and so, so um, you know, what, what is really clear in writing studies is that we, we have models in our head and we get them from reading a lot. And that's why reading a lot tends to correlate to feeling more comfortable with writing. It means you've got more templates. But what this means is that we have the templates that are for writing we can't do. And, um, and so one thing I would strongly suggest is look at junior scholars work. Um, look at um, scholarship written by graduate students or assistant professors in your field, in your journals, and notice things like how long are their introductions? What posture do they take? And I'll get to that um, in, a, in a bit. Uh, Highland and Swales say that for the most part, junior scholars are additive. That is, they don't refute um, an existing position they um, sometimes synthesize, sometimes do method methodological, but they, it's very rare for junior scholars to get published, you know, taking a really um, radical stance on something. And um, uh, also you don't, you're not reading the genre that you're writing. N nobody reads a dissertation unless they're paid to do it. <laughs> it's just not, it's just not something, it's, they're not fun. They're not fun to write and they're not fun to read. Um, 
And it's because they're doing a certain kind of work and that's fine. But um, I know that um, Michael and Kristen often encourage people to read dissertations. And you just wanna be careful that you read dissertations that are gonna serve as good models for you in some way, that they're close enough to what you're trying to do, that they'll be really helpful in that regard. Um, and it's, you know, it's the same thing with uh, grant applications, which I find really hard. That's, no, that's not a genre I ever got good at. And um, it's partially because in my field, there, wa there wasn't a set, number, there, a set kind of grant that people were applying for and grants can be different from one field to another. So anyway, um, and um, so what do you do about this? Well, one is I think that we need to be more comfortable writing crap. Um, and the, and um, what happens with, oops, um, with people is, uh, so, you know, good writers are good revisers, really. And so if you're, if you just let yourself write really bad shit, just write it. Um, but one, one friend um, always talked about the, the narcissistic pleasures of the first draft. So the first draft is for you. You just are just dumping your stuff, just getting your ideas onto, onto paper. Um, in my early drafts, not just first, but like early, uh, um, blarg turns up as a verb a lot because I can't get the right word. And so I just write blarg. Um, and um, was his face writes a lot of articles that I'm citing and books I'm referring to um, or blargy McBlarg face. Um, and you, so you just do, you know, you just do that. And, you know, sometimes the reference will actually be that book with the blue cover um, says such and such and such. So you just, you just go ahead and do that and don't, and don't worry about it. Um, by the way, the reason I took to doing Blarg and Blargy McBlarg face is that um, sometimes I, I, then I would go through, uh, I, I wouldn't notice that I had one of those things in there and would forget to take it out. So my dissertation actually has in brackets at one point, should I talk about this more? <laughs> so, yeah, okay. So you do, you do want some kind of, you know, something you can do find and replace uh, at some point. And um, I find this really, really helpful. And it's that it, um, start by admiring your friendly audience. And uh, a guy a long time ago wrote about, um, about uh, I think it's called something like writing with my eyes closed and about the way that we have a tendency to, um, as, as undergrads, and it works, to we try to write in a way that will impress the teacher. Well, you get to writing your dissertation, you've got five people you're trying to impress, and you can get into some really not great dynamics trying to do that. So um, instead, so to get a first draft, just to get some stuff on paper, it can be really helpful to imagine a fairly friendly audience, but who doesn't know a lot about what you're talking about. So that's one of the ways I think that Writing Center is really helpful. You, you can find yourself kind of writing for a consultant that you've met with a bunch that you like, who's not in your field. So you're gonna explain stuff, that can be good. I often tell students to write for their favorite undergraduate teacher um, and uh, that they haven't talked to in a while, that can be really helpful. Um, somebody in, um, somebody in the department that you don't know very well, but you, a faculty member, but that seems really nice um, and um, someone else in class. So that's, that's a, a one strategy to get a, a draft out. I think it can be super, super helpful to in, um, start with a question or a puzzle or something weird. So, and, and um, we have a tendency to reward us uh, in standardized testing and also in undergraduate writing, what's called the summary introduction. And the summary introduction summarizes your whole um, argument. And also what it does is it provides what people in rhetoric call a partition or a partitio, which is the map. So we try to write that first. And as an undergrad or when you're writing an exam, that's a great strategy because it, it keeps you within the, the map that you've set out, right? And so then you tend not to wander off into other areas. It's not great for writing um, seminar papers. It's okay for writing seminars papers, but it's not great. And it's really not very helpful for trying to write books, articles, or dissertations. 
um, because you don't know what you're going to write yet. And so um, what can be really helpful is instead set out the question very, very clearly. So what is what question are you pursuing and why is it an interesting question? And then once you've written your whole thing, you can go back and rewrite the introduction. Then you can do a summary introduction once you've, once you've got the whole thing done. Often, and if you look at um, scholarly uh, journals in a lot of fields, especially the sciences and social sciences, they'll actually have that question as the first part and then the summary. So they'll spend two to three paragraphs explaining why this is an important issue, how it hasn't been answered so far, why the question is really, really interesting, and then they'll give their answer. Um, unless it's controversial, in which case they delay it, which Cicero pointed out a long time ago, which I think is interesting. Um, okay, and, um, and don't feel like you have to write your paper in order. Super, super important advice, write it in any order that works for you. Um, start with the paragraph or the section that you feel most confident about. Um, in my field, students often feel most confident about the text and their reading of the text. So I say, start with your evidence. In talking to people in the social sciences, they will often do the methods section first uh, because that's what they feel most confident about. Um, sometimes they'll do the um, discussion section. They do it in different orders, but I have noticed that an awful lot of people I talk to write the literature review last. And it's because, um, and the, or second to last, and their introduction is absolute last. The reason I think the literature review is gonna be fairly late in the process is that's when you know what literature you're citing and referring to. So, you know, don't feel like you have to write stuff in order. Um, and, you know, also what can be really, and this is, this is very strange advice, but it actually works. What can be a really good way to get started on a writing process is start with how you got to this question. And um, like, Four of the six books I've written, and actually five if you include the one I'm writing now, start with the same introduction, which is how I, I, you know, why I got into rhetoric, how I ended up at this point. It's not in any of the final versions, but it enabled me to write the paper and then you could go back and write a different introduction. So that kind of personal narrative of, of how did I come to this question and why do I think it's an interesting question can get you writing and that's, that's really all that you really need to do in it. And um, okay, then the, the last part is, um, um, oh, okay, somebody made, made a comment about this. And, and so the other reason I think it's really useful to start with a question is if you start with an insight, if you then in doing your research find that someone else has made that argument, you, you, you feel collapsed, like everything is gone and you don't know what you're gonna write anymore. If you think about the question, that you're trying to pose that someone has posed an answer doesn't end what you're doing. There's, there, you might come up with a different answer. So I just find that, that focusing on the question rather than the argument um, reduces anxiety and reduces uh, writing blocks really. Okay, so then um, instead of thinking about a gap, I think it can be helpful to, um, the term I always use is posture because I almost feel like it's like how you're standing in relation to the, to the work that's there. You know, are you really leaning into it? Are you refuting it? But anyway, we'll, we'll go away from my oral interp background. Um, all right, so the most common is additive. And the, in an additive stance, you're um, taking existing research and you're adding to it in some way. It doesn't necessarily surprise anybody. It doesn't necessarily, um, nobody's gonna be angry with you for you know, this, this research that you're doing. So that's the classic. Um, someone has used this theory to explain this historical incident or this text or this movement or this um, phenomenon and you're taking what they've said and, uh, and applying it to a different one. <clears throat> um, another, uh, that's a really, really common one I think that um, people do. Another one, well, another one that's kind of additive is, um, thank you for your tale, sweetie, um, is, um, is the one, it, uh, it's sometimes called translation work. And so it's where you say, here's this concept that's in this field that our field would find really helpful. And once again, it's not that you're refuting anybody in your field. You're just saying, hey, here's this concept that will help us with um, something that we're doing. 
One kind of dissertation, at least in the humanities that you see a lot, and you see it in some of the social sciences, is a definitional. And it's the one where you say, okay, so our field is struggling with this kind of question, this problem. Um, it's really common law. And it is, um, and we're seeing it as, um, um, as, as a question of um, historicizing. Well, I don't think it really is historicizing that we're doing. I think instead we're doing this other thing. And so you're just describing what people are doing with a new definition. And um, sometimes uh, it's, you see that as a prior question move. Everybody's looking at it this way, but I think we need to step back and reconsider our terms. Um, there was a certain point in time when you saw a lot of that kind of research in um, both history and literature where people were talking a lot about um, historical periods. And so how are we gonna define you know, this period versus that period? That's kind of gone, but that's an example. Um, a lot of dissertations are methodological. And this is something that I didn't, I didn't realize until I started directing them. Um, and a methodological dissertation is where you're providing a new method that you think will really help other people. You see it again, a lot in the sciences. Um, you see it, uh, one of my students ended up doing it uh, when she wanted to get to the question of whether using literature in writing classes is really as harmful as a lot, a lot of people say. And um, so then she had to figure out how, you, how do you assess writing? Um, and how do you assess the effectiveness of writing classes? So she ended up doing a, a big study on teaching evaluations and what relationship teaching evaluations have to other ways that we might assess effectiveness of a class. Um, and so ended up with a dissertation that just argued about how we should use teaching evaluations. So that's a, you know, that's a methodological. And she got there because she never did get to the <laughs> To the question that she started with, um, she ended, you know, trying to get there got her first in this um, in this other one. Refutative is the one we often think we have to do, and it's where you're going to say that somebody's wrong. In some fields, you simply do not do that, and it seems to me that that in education you just don't do it. Um, and so my field is um, rhetoric. We have some people that are sort of over on the writing composition side. Those journals you don't do it. Um, I'm, some of my stuff is in communication. In communication, you do it. And that's, I think, because those guys were debaters. And, um, so you, you name who you're, who you're disagreeing with. And if you can't name someone that you're disagreeing with, it's not going to get published. So you can figure out whether that's acceptable in your field by once again, looking at junior scholars, research, scholarship in published journals that you want to publish in. Do they name their opposition? Do they have an opposition? Or is it some sort of vague, you know, some people say. Um, and um, then synthesizing is um, something I think one sees a lot in um, uh, trying to say history. I feel like you see it some, um, some of the social sciences. And that's why you're saying there appear to be these different approaches or different theories, but you can actually bring them together and see that they're, they're together, they, they're doing these, these things or here are shared premises that they have. Um, and then taxonomic is fairly unusual. It used to be much, much more common, but taxonomic is the kind where you say the, um, uh, there are five kinds of romantic poetry. Um, there are, um, you know, our, our field is broken into four different groups. And it's, I, I, I don't know, Chris and Michael, have you seen one like that recently? Because I just don't, I don't think people do that very much anymore. No, not really. No, yeah, I don't think they do. Yeah. Um, it's funny, at one point I had an office that was right near where the old college English journals were. Northrop Fry. I was about to say that. That's really hilarious, um, and um, uh, and it was really so. These you know, College English is a big journal in my field, and so um, I was looking at these articles like from the '40s and stuff, and they were all taxonomic, uh, and a lot of them were genre. You know, that is this really a long poem, um, or is this an epic poem? And and yeah, but anyway, um, those are the things. So, um, okay, perfect, I did it. Uh, mainly, I, so I wanted to sort of throw all this stuff out at you, but mainly um, just, you know, talk, have conversations and, um, 
answer questions and yeah. So this was intended to be sort of tidbits that that will uh, get you. Oh yeah. Yeah, getting mad also does. I mean, it works for some people. Um, there's another strategy that works uh, for some people, which is the, um, uh, I can never think of it as anything other than the bullshit method, but the bullshit method is that you say that you're gonna prove something and you just announce some thesis and then you try to, it works for certain personality types. I will also say that the writing process is really different depending on if, you, um, if you're doing any kind of research that requires an IRB or requires grants or something like that, then you have to, then you, you have to know, um, then everything I'm talking about is really early on before you apply for your IRB, you're figuring all this stuff out uh, because in some fields, you, you can change your thesis and you can change a lot of stuff as you're writing, like the student that I worked with, but you can't if you're gonna have to get IRB approval or if you're gonna have to get grants or something, then, then um, you, I think it's, these are still good ways to start, but then you will need, before you start applying for grants, to have a pretty good idea of what you're gonna prove. Oops, my cat added stuff. All right, so if anyone has any questions or comments, they're wel you're welcome to raise them in the chat or you know raise your hand. Um, Trish, I actually had one for you. So you talked a bit about the impossibility of reading all this scholarship on any one topic like Joseph Conrad. Um, can you talk a little bit more about like how much is enough? Like when do you know when to stop? <laughs> or maybe even some strategies for transitioning from the research into the writing. You know, I get a lot of questions about like, should I research and then write and then research and write? Should I do all of my research and then do all of the writing? You know, how much is enough? Like how far down the rabbit hole should you go before it is a form of procrastination or something that's less productive? Yeah, well, first notice all the books, right? So, so yeah, I'm I'm very much prone to the like, God, maybe I need to read this. Um, it's very hard for, a, for for scholars now because there are very few fields that are not interdisciplinary. So there's always going to be somebody who's in a related field, and it can be really hard to figure out what you um, what you need to read. To some extent, that's the job of the of the committee. I mean, the, your advisors should be telling you, here's, that's, that's one way you pick an advisor, people who are gonna know and who are gonna be able to say, you need to read this, this is really, really important. Um, I think it's also hard for people in the last year or so because that's what conferences are really good for. I feel like one of the things that, that happens when you go to a conference is you just hear, oh, everybody's talking about so-and-so, so that's, that's somebody that I'm really gonna need to read. You also hear somebody give a talk, um, and you get to talk to them afterwards. And so I, I feel like that it's, it's, it's kind of the conversations in the hall and conferences that are, that are really helpful. Um, the, I know that a lot of people believe that you shouldn't uh, be reading while you're writing, but I think that just depends on how your memory works and, and you know, what's, what's gonna work for you and what's gonna work under different circumstances. I find that if I get too far away from something, if I don't make notes on something I've read, then I'm not gonna remember it. Um, so, you know, that's, it's also hard if you're using material like archival material that, and you're in the archive and you're gonna go back home, um, you have to start writing as you're, as you're doing that research. Um, you also, I think if, if you're, um, and library books, right? If it's, li if it's library books, you're gonna have to return and you can't mark them up, then you're gonna need to do more of that. Uh, things have changed now, because I know an awful lot of people find Zotero really, really helpful. Um, and that's, that's specifically the one that people talk about. It's, a, it's based on, a, on an older version that I tried using and, and didn't have good luck with. So, um, um, it, it, so I, I, I think what um, I'm going to give the lamest answer possible, which is 
not to be rigid about any of those rules about whether you research and then write, just try different ones and, and see what's gonna work. It's also gonna work differently. When I'm doing like the lit review section of stuff, I have all the books open um, in front of me and you're really, you know, you're needing to use those. Um, but, but there are other parts of what I'm writing that, I'm, it, that aren't like that. So um, I also find, and this is gonna sound kind of strange, but if you're writing things like your introduction or conclusion or the stuff that's really, here's, here's what I'm trying to say, the big meta discourse stuff, you um, sometimes I find it helpful to like go, that's where that's the kind of writing I can do in a coffee shop or sometimes handwriting or something. That's getting away from the text for writing that can be really helpful, but not for the close analysis and not for the literature review. So yeah, that's gonna. And you know, for those people who have to do methods sections, we don't, in my field, we don't really have a methods section. Your methods are implied by who you're citing. Um, but in fields that have to do a methods section, that's one where people talk about getting away from the sources and writing it. I love this description. This is um, Mark Music's description, but I really love it. He said, it should be a cookbook. Your methods section for an experiment should be something that somebody else could take up and do your experiment. And, um, and he said, he's even suspicious of, of ones that were there, they're not, they're not done that way. So that's a field that has a very, very separate and fairly long method section which is not the case in a lot of fields. Did that kind of answer the question? Yeah. But um, um, I'm also shameless about um, when you're talking about a concept that's from another field, um, I think that, that it used to be called, I think it's called Gale eBooks, is really, really helpful. Um, I recommend it to my grad students all the time. So that is, um, it's electronic source that has um, compiled all of the like, you know, encyclopedia of rhetoric, dictionary of race and racism. Um, and so sometimes when you're looking for a cogent summary of a book or a concept, going there can be really, really helpful because it's gonna be um, a major scholar who's, who's written this. Um, it's not gonna change like Wikipedia does. Um, and, um, but you're, you're gonna get an authoritative description of here's the distinction between post-structuralism and post-modernism. And then you don't have to invent it yourself. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that. And you can get that through the databases in the UT library. Um, and, um, um, oh, okay. So as far as structuring writing time, oh my God, so many tips. Okay. <laughs> and this is another one where you just have to figure out what works for you. I was a night person uh, for a long time. And so I did my best writing, you know, like after 10 o'clock at night. And then at some point I just changed and it took me a while to figure that out. And I, I discovered that I became one of those people who if I got up at 4.30 in the morning, I was much more productive. So that's just that. Um, and um, a lot of people swear by that method. The, the four o'clock or 4.30 in the morning method um, means that you, you've got a couple hours before anybody else gets up, which you know for some people, they really like that. I also had another point in my life when I was running a huge composition program that um, you know at a lot of universities, as, as somebody once said, you could shoot a bullet and not hit anybody if you fired before 10 in the morning or after three in the afternoon. And so what that meant is if I got to my office early, I could get a lot of writing done before people started coming in with crises about the photocopier. Um, at three o'clock in the afternoon, I wasn't capable of writing. It just, I had no brain then. So, um, but that was a point when I could do things like it was, it's actually useful to edit at that point. And I should actually, let me, let me explain that. That's, this, this is one way I'm very rigid in my writing. So um, what we try to do when we write, and this works for tons of circumstances, for email, for um, you know, undergraduate papers, for lots of stuff, is as you, you sit down to write and you're trying to create and edit at the same time, create, critique, and revise. So you're sitting there and you're like, okay, since the dawn of time, people have been talking about rhetoric. Well, I don't wanna use dawn of time. Okay, since the, and so you're trying to do it sentence by sentence. 
That's fine for lots of writing. It's not a good way to write a book or a dissertation or an article. Um, so that's what I was saying. You get your first, that narcissistic first draft down. Then you go back and critique it and you're not solving the problems. You're just commenting on, does this make sense? It can be a lot of questions to yourself. Um, is this where this belongs? Should I put this later? So just lots and lots of questions. And then there's a third pass where you're coming through and you're actually trying to change things. And that's where you're trying to solve those problems. And, um, and that's the one thing that I'm fairly rigid about. And I find it really, really helpful. Um, it reduces anxiety again, because when you're doing the critiquing, you're just critiquing and you're not, um, you're not going to get yourself into some uh, spiral of anxiety by thinking, I don't know what to do with this sentence. Oh my God, I'm not going to be able to finish this. Oh my God, I'm not going to um, finish my dissertation. And then I'd always imagine myself as a waitress in Barstow because I hate Barstow and I'd be a lousy waitress. Um, so yeah, instead you just critique it. All right, so what, <laughs> this is going back to time. What I found was that's what I could do at three o'clock in the afternoon. I could go back through and be critical of my stuff. And the fact that I was actually not very bright was useful because <laughs> I'd be like, I don't, even I don't know what I mean here. Um, so I think that, that um, can be really good. Some people find it very helpful to get away from stuff. So some people write that you write your first chapter, you finish it, you get it approved, you move on to your second chapter, you finish it, you get it approved, you write your third chapter. That doesn't work for me. Um, you know, I write a chapter, um, critique it, move on to a new ch another chapter, critique that, move on, generate the kind of first draft, and then go back to the first chapter. So that's and but some dissertation committees won't let you do that. So that's fine. You just you know, a good dissertation has four signatures on it. That's. That's what constitutes a good uh, dissertation. So if your dissertation committee insists that you do this step by step, then you then do it. Um, and the um, other thing I would say about uh, writing is that some people, so next year, the writing center will get back to doing the writing retreats. Um, and some people find those really, really helpful. You're just around other people who are writing a lot and just that there's some, it, this sounds very California of me, but there's something about that energy that some people find really, really useful. Um, I can't do that. I can't write if other people are around, it's just not gonna work. Um, but, you know, so you, 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 you do what works. Uh, some people also find it very helpful to do, I know that the Writing Center talks a lot about the Pomodoro method, and um, so that's, that's a method where you, you work for a certain amount of time and you stop regardless, at, you know, regardless of um, whether you're done or not, you stop and you take a break. For reading, um, it seems to work pretty well to do like to read for 25 minutes and then take a five minute break. But for writing, at least for me and a lot of people I know, 45 minutes seems to be the magic number. Um, under under 25 just isn't quite enough. So you write for 45 minutes and you, I think getting up is really important and walking around, um, getting a drink of water, whatever. What I found when I started doing um, the, uh, so at a certain point when I was mentoring students, I thought I need to know how I spend my time so I can figure this kind of thing out. And so I started using a, um, an app called Toggle. And you just say, okay, you know, now I'm writing, now I'm reading. And what I found is that if I didn't do the Pomodoro method, so I'd, in the morning, I was on sabbatical the first time I, I started using it. So I, in the morning, I'd write for three hours straight without getting up. By afternoon, I couldn't work more than 10 minutes at a time. So, so the Pomodoro method really is a good method of making yourself take, you know, take regular breaks. Um, I'm a big believer in a break in the middle of the day. You go for a walk, go to the gym, something. Um, and, um, and then also, you know, figuring out your circadian rhythms, figuring out, um, I got no research done before teaching, just zero. I was just obsessed with teaching. So it was, it was I just gave up on trying. I just stopped trying because I was just gonna beat myself up. Procrastination is your friend. I also discovered that I 
um, over-prepared classes. And so I found that procrastinating class prep meant that I became a better teacher. And, um, and I wasn't spending so much time. I then had more time for other stuff. You can also um, procrastinate. Um, uh, so I, when grading papers, which is hard, the, those papers that are really confusing, usually B plus papers, you have trouble figuring them out. I, um, uh, I would leave those until the morning that I, ha I had to return them. And then I'd get up at 4.30 in the morning and finish them. And, you know, so that's a time that I was sort of using panic to, to, to be my friend. But yeah, procrastinating is not always a bad, a bad move. Um, and, um, uh, okay, and so also um, in my field, the classic piece of advice is that you have a seminar paper, you turn that into a conference paper, um, you turn that into an article, and then that becomes a chapter. And if you can do that, great. And I do know lots of people who, who manage to follow that strategy. That doesn't work for me. Articles actually are usually part of a book. I've already sort of gotten the book imagined and then I can do the article, but that's just the way that I think. And um, there are a lot of people like that, I think. So just, you know, whatever works. Um, some, <clears throat> I strongly recommend that you use um, conferences to work on papers that will be part of some kind of publication, your dissertation or your book. I got really tempted. I just wanted to go to these conferences. And so I'd create papers, one-off sorts, a lot of one-off papers for these conferences. And that was not a good use of my time. Um, they, they really should be oriented towards something that's, that, um, um, you um, that that you're headed toward, um, and, and um, oh, that's also one of the things about writing groups that's super helpful is just accountability. And um, and there's there's not great scholarship on on writing group. There's lots of great work where people are talking about their experience and stuff, but I haven't seen any really good qualitative studies on them. And um, so there needs to be accountability in the groups. And um, so I've, oh, I always have, I still have one, um, writing groups for my graduate students because I'm there and they're, they're gonna be less likely to be like, eh, I didn't get anything done this week. So um, you don't have to be punitive about it, but um, I, you know, I've had students who had writing groups where if you, um, if, if you didn't produce you know, for the writing group, then you had to buy, you had to bring cookies or something like that, some minor thing, but just um, um, just some kind of accountability is, um, is really good. It's very hard during COVID. <laughs> we were talking before about, I mean, I retired in, spring, in, in September and here it is, you know, spring and I, I'm still not clear what, like what day it is or anything. It's very strange. Um, everybody, like, you know, if, if you, where if you're wearing pants, good for you. You know, I mean, I just feel like we need to have very, very different standards during COVID and I think everybody does. Um, and so um, what, what um, and, and managing anxiety, I think is just a, it's a really hard part of, of graduate school under the best of circumstances. Uh, the mental health services has really good dissertation writing groups that are oriented toward just talking about, you know, the sort of anxiety that um, that people have. And what what I think can be helpful about those is you discover that even though this person's in sociology and this person's in biology, there are there are shared experiences. Um, so those those can then be really helpful. And I think that's the hard one of the things about COVID is finding a way to express the anxiety without like just wallowing in it. Um, so, and I was, I don't know, not great about, Kristen might have good advice on, on how to do that. Shall I um, have a question kind of related to this like shared anxiety of COVID times? And it's, it's really related to, I feel like I have a very different writing style and working style than one of my advisors. And I feel like we have had difficulties, you know, that of communication. And so what are ways that we as grad students can approach like, like talking to our advisors about how our creation style is different, if that makes sense? Or like, so for instance, 
if they want something really, really polished, but you would love for them to look at a rougher draft uh, to help you move forward is a great example. Yeah, that is a good example. And there are some people who just aren't going to do it. Um, and I hate to say that, you know, but um, it's that, you know, you, you kind of, you can't train your advisor. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, and so get a different advisor. I was, when I was a junior scholar, I mean, but I don't mean fire that advisor. I mean, get another one. Yeah. You know, get, get somebody else that's going to help you in the, in that kind of way. Um, when I was a junior scholar, that was a big problem for me because the only two people in rhetoric at my first university didn't, didn't write the kind of stuff I was writing. They didn't publish in places I wanted to publish. Um, they, and they had very different writing processes. And it didn't occur to me that what I needed to do was um, contact like graduate students from my program. <laughs> you know, and that's, um, and that was the solution as it turned out was, was to start working with them. So um, you, um, and, and it's, it, we tried this in my program and it was too stressful for students. There are some programs where you meet on a regular basis with your committee. And I thought that was really good because it got your committee all on the same page, but it, it was too stressful for students. Um, and um, uh, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, Zoom writing groups are, are kind of hard. Also, um, for some reason, I don't, I really don't know why I thought this. For a long time, I thought writing groups had to be everybody brought in a few pages. And then I discovered that when people are writing dissertations, it's actually better if, um, if you have one person who's brought in 10 or 20 pages of a relatively polished thing and you all talk about that one thing and the next week you talk about a different one. It's, I don't know why, but for, uh, for dissertation writing and for book writing, that just worked better. Um, so that's, so there are also, you know, things like that, that you can, um, you can really try. Um, and um, so, I, I, all right, so, so we haven't talked about mechanics, which is just really fascinating. Um, oh, do I have, do I have, okay, let's see. So, let's see if this will work. Um, okay. So, I don't know, so can you, can you see, all right, so you can't read that and I don't expect you to, but what I want you to see is this is me writing about my own writing. So this is a draft of mine and I've got comments to the side um, that are, oh, in the future, I wanna do this or that. Um, and then, but what, what you can't necessarily see is the pink stuff is grammatical, okay? Now, I'm a professor of rhetoric. I am queen of grammar. Um, we can have long discussions about adjectival versus adverbial clauses. And I make grammar mistakes <laughs> on the first four drafts. So, um, and it's because there are a lot of grammar mistakes that are really interesting um, and significant like predication, long word, um, subject verb agreement. So it's not something to worry about until fairly far along in a, in a process. Um, and a lot of times, especially for someone who's a native speaker, those kinds of, um, those kinds of mistakes are, um, are just because we're focused on ideas. There was research that was done a long time ago, like 20 years ago, um, that suggested that people, even faculty, if they're they're asked to write about something that they're just learning about will make a lot of grammar mistakes and their sentence level clarity just collapses. So, and and, and uh, they'll engage in, in um, uh, pastiche plagiarism too. But um, so yeah, so don't, so, you know, don't worry about that on, on early versions. Um, and um, the, um, so once, you know, once you've got all that sort of stuff done, then you can kind of go back and, Grammarly is getting better all the time. Um, I don't like it as a teaching tool because, um, because I think people start using it too early and it, it also has a tendency to make style um, recommendations, but that are, are really wonky and stuff. 
Um, but for an individual, I think that that can be you know reasonably good. For someone whose whose English is really good, um, reading uh, reading out loud, which is one of the reasons that's often the way a lot of writing center consultations go. Reading out loud can can mean that people catch them. But um, we have world, the issues that there are world Englishes. So there are things, and American English is really weird, and academic American English is particularly strange. So um, there are there are things that are correct, and somebody is a native speaker of English, but at, you know an American reader is going to be like, what? What are you doing there? Also, um, when when people are, um, I'm going to forget the term. Uh, anyway, mimetic. There it is. So um, learning a new thing, initially it's mimetic and then it becomes trans transactional. Meaning that um, if you're learning golf, initially you just kind of try to stand like the person and do it the way that they do. And then at some point you understand why they're standing that way and then you might do it differently, right? So in, um, in scholarly writing, first year grad school, people write really badly. And they write really badly because they're, they're kind of, um, mimicking the academic writing and not necessarily getting the moves correctly. And it's just first year and it goes away and don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, and um, um, the, uh, oh yeah, and, and uh, so pronoun antecedents is, is a really, really interesting one. So subject verb agreement is, is surprisingly interesting. Um, subject verb agreement, we get that wrong a lot. Um, we, have tr we struggle with it because as we're writing, we aren't clear whether we want to write about media in general or um, one particular media. Are we making claims about, um, you know, audiences or an audience? Also, we'll do a lot of the sentences that are like, um, integrity and honesty is important. Technically, a subject verb agreement but it's an interesting indication of how a writer's thinking. Because what they're thinking is integrity and honesty are these two ways of talking about the same thing. Um, so yeah, so I, I mean, I think like grammar errors are fascinating. Um, and the pronoun antecedent problems are interesting because that's what's called writer-based prose. So in the first couple of drafts, you're writer-based and you know what you're referring to, but it, someone else is, is not going to. So I said first draft, narcissistic pleasures of the first draft. Um, the second draft is whether it's what you mean. And, um, and I should actually say that for me, first draft is first through third or something. <laughs> anyway, so, so that's all you're focusing on with that like second version is, is this really the thing I'm trying to say? And it's not until the third that you start thinking about audience. And is this gonna make sense to anybody else? And I. I don't know of any writers who don't have other people read their stuff. I just don't think we can get um, good, we, we need feedback. We're just, um, that level of perspective shifting, forgetting what you've said so completely that you can read it as though it's someone who hasn't read it before is, I don't think it's possible. Even with my graduate students, I get to, because of the weekly writing group, I get to a point where I'm not a good reader for them because I've read it so many times that I'm, I don't know if they're making, it makes sense to me, but it makes sense because I've read it so many times and I don't know if someone just picking up this up for the first time is gonna read it. And that's, that's why there are four people on a committee. Um. Oh, okay. So as far as uh, organizing citation first and start our own writing. Um, okay. So, um, oh, such a great question. And um, so many answers, but I'm gonna do really fast. Uh, <laughs> um, once again, it's, it's, it's gonna depend on what it is that you're writing and what you're doing with it. So, um, um, let me see if I've got a page in here where I'm doing that. Um, oh, okay. So for instance, sometimes I use the comment function for that that I will, you know, I'll just write it and then I'll have in the comments, I'll just put in here are the people that I'm gonna work in eventually to this. And 
um, unsolicited advice is on early drafts, when you cite something, cite it totally, thoroughly, and completely. By which I mean, you give the full name, you give the full title, you give the page number, you give the year. And if you do it in a comment, that's fine, or footnotes or whatever strategy you wanna use. The reason that you wanna do that is when you come back to stuff later, um, you don't wanna be me, where you're looking at it and going, oh, Arendt, 44, great. I'm citing six different books by Hannah Arendt. <laughs> so yeah, and so then you're going like 44. Is it is it on this page? No. Okay. So you do yeah, just oversight um, uh, in um, in in really early stuff. Some people when they get so um, what I would recommend is when you get stuck, do the other. So if you're if you're writing and you kind of hit a block and you can't do it, then go back and start with your citations and try it that way. Um, some chapters of a book I've written by starting just with my data, just the quotes. Um, and even to the point of like, I took the quotes, I had a file that just had the quotes I wanted to use. And then I wrote from one quote to the next. You know, if it gets a draft, it works. <laughs> so. Oh, also, uh, um, so um, when you're out outlining, I, I don't recommend the uh, Romistic outline. It actually comes from this guy, Pierre de la Rome, who um, 16th century, I'll spare you the long story, but I actually have a chapter in a book about him. But um, uh, don't get too tied up in the, in the outline. I like to think of it as flowcharts. I think flowcharts work a little bit better. What are the what are the concepts you're going to have to talk about? And you start with an initial idea. I think I'm going to do it in this order, but it it ends up moving. And then everyone has a floating section, and the floating section is something you're going to need to explain. It's off in the background, and you don't know is this going to be a footnote? Is it going to be introduction? Is it going to be conclusion? Is it going to, where is it going to be? And don't you don't have to know for it. And sometimes it takes a while. Um, in the same way that sometimes if you're comparing three things um, and you're comparing five criteria, your three texts or authors or historical incidents or whatever, and you're comparing them in, the, in five by five criteria, you don't always know whether you're gonna organize it ultimately by the five criteria or by the three authors. And so just start writing and you'll figure it out. Um, yeah. And I, I have to admit, I don't remember whether we were going to stop at 1.30 or 1.45. <laughs> um, well, we had space until 1.45, but we can we can stop now. That works well. Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, as you guys can tell, I can talk about this endlessly. I just think it's fascinating. Um, I love uh, teaching writing and I love, you know, working with students, graduate and undergraduate on writing because I'm a bad writer. Uh, and so it actually really helps to be a bad writer because I know how you get bad writing to good writing. And I know a lot of people who are just really good writers and um, they don't, they kind of don't know. They're just like, you just write it, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so. All right. All right, looks like we do have one hand. Did you wanna? Yeah, I just want to kind of follow up a questions about organizing the writing material because I, I have seen so many advice on how people should organize things, and I feel like one challenge for me is like, some people suggest that when you find good citation, you just put them away and then put them all in one document, and when you are writing, leave that document open and then rephrase some of the material from it like that's one suggestion I have heard but I also have seen some suggestion that when you find some code you are interested in rephrase it immediately and put it in your note I think either way have its strengths but like I feel it's all like sometimes I feel like if I rephrase every sentence I was like oh this could be useful or this could be important it take too much time in the in in the like reading phrase um yeah. So I, I kind of jumping around these two methods and I kind of want to know your insight on it. Yeah, and there's, um, I, you know, I wish that there were a magical way to do it, but if there were, then everybody would have a PhD, right? So, you know, writing a dissertation is hard. 
Um, but what I can say is that, so each has its disadvantages. What I'm not wild about with that second method is for myself, I find that I, lo I lose track of where the quote is from. Um, or I slightly misremember it or something. So I've actually found that I need to hold on to the original quote um, and, and, and you know, put that, at, have that in a document. Um, that's what can be really nice about Zotero or about various ways of marking up PDFs or something. Um, I'm a big believer in marking up books, which you know, horrifies some people, but it, you know, it works for me. And um, what I actually like about either that you've got a PDF that you've, you hold on to the PDF and you mark it up or that you mark up a book is sometimes when I go back to the quote, um, I, I now understand it differently. And, um, and, or I go back to the quote and I over time have altered it in my memory. And so seeing it in context, I'm much more aware of what it means. So, so for me, and just the way that I tend to work and I tend to think about things, I, I feel like the more that I can hang on to the quote in context, the more likely I am to be able to, to represent it correctly and usefully. Um, but, uh, but where that's really a problem is I did a book that was about where I had to do a lot of archival research with newspapers. And, um, uh, you know, so I was, I, this was actually in the days of microforms, right? So I'm reading all these stupid microforms. And even if I like spent a zillion dollars printing up these different pages, then my problem was I had a tendency to get lost in how interesting these 1830 newspapers were. And so, so that can be sort of a, um, um, you know, th that can be sort of the disadvantage of keeping it in context. It's just if that, and you're like, oh, I forgot how weird this article was. And yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I feel like there was a struggle in between how correct you are citing this code based on its originally context. And, but also it, it's very easy to get distracted if I keep that paper open. And I was like, oh, I kind of follow the, the author's writing logic of that paper. And then I was yeah. like, I forgot what I was trying to say here. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, I'm actually not a big fan of Strunk and White. Um, and um, uh, someone asked about Strunk and White, and I'm, it's, I know it's kind of a strange thing. It's like kicking puppies or something, not to like Strunk and White, um, but, um, but they mix up prescriptive and descriptive grammar, and they mi mix up things that are just questions of style and with, with things that are really grammatically important. Um, and so, you know, uh, in some fields, you have to use passive voice. It's absolutely required. And, and, um, and that's just the way it works. And then in other fields, you really don't use passive voice. You completely stay away from it, but you do use passive agency, right? Which is slightly different, but that also varies. So um, yeah, so I, I just, I get, um, um, I'm trying to figure out the 45 second version of, of this answer. So when I talk to students about this, I always compare it to etiquette. And um, that there are some, some rules of etiquette that are absolutely necessary for us to get along. Um, and then there are some that are just class markers and, and you wanna kind of keep those separate. And I feel like Strunk and White don't necessarily do that. So, yeah. But I, I, I don't know, Kristen and, and Michael, what do you guys think? I haven't used Grammarly in a while, but last I heard it was getting better, right? I personally don't use it. Um, I, the students that I work with, I, those who do, I think do like it, but still don't rely on it exclusively. Yeah, that's the thing you can, yeah. Because ultimately there may be reasons that you've decided. If, so in my field, for instance, we talk about arguing with somebody versus arguing at them. Now Grammarly is gonna tell you that's wrong, but I, I mean at, right? Arguing at somebody is really different uh, from arguing with them. So it, that's why it always has to remain as a, as a suggestion for what you're gonna do. Grammarly, I use it. I definitely use other things too. It gets, it 
if you can get used to a lot of like style suggestions, it will learn your style and adapt, eventually making them less likely. But it, it's like you have to be OK with a ton of style errors until it figures out your voice and tone. The, when it when it was when word had something like that, you could also tell it don't don't do that, don't tell me about this or that kind of thing. But yeah. Uh, oh, and Colm is really good. Yeah. Um, and and um, oh, you know, I'm glad somebody mentioned um, Joseph Williams. So Joseph Williams, Style Ten Lessons in Clarity and Grace, actually came out of his working with grad students, specifically grad students in law. And, and so I actually think that that's one of the most useful. Um, he's not totally opposed to passive voice, um, but, he's, but he talks about when you'd use passive voice and when not, for instance. And his whole point about, I think he's really, he and Cole are both ones that make, they, they make you think about, well, how would this, how, how would my ar argument be different if I made this the subject? versus that the subject rather than one being right or wrong. So yeah, that's, that's a really, really good one. Yeah. Okay, well, um, let's go ahead and thank our speaker. Thank Professor Roberts Miller. Sure. Hopping there. Uh, yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, so this workshop was recorded, so it'll be posted on our YouTube channel and our website. Um, and Thank you all for coming and we'll see you next time. Thanks guys.